Yes. So hello, everybody, and a warm, warm welcome to this webinar. And first, wish you all a very, very happy new year. Lots of running this year for all the running enthusiasts. And of course, injury-free running. And that's why we all are here to hear it from none other than Dr. Abhay Nene. Well, Dr. Abhay Nene is here with us, and Dr. Nene needs no, no introduction. We all know he's a highly renowned spine surgeon in Mumbai with over 20 years of experience and specialized uh, training that he's received in surgery uh, with uh, Dr. Shekhar Bhojraj from the Spine Foundation. And they run a group practice for spine surgery uh, under the banner of We Are Spine currently. And Dr. Nene is available at most of the leading hospitals in Bombay, Leelavati, Bridge Candy, Kokila Ben, Hinduja, you name it all. And Dr. Nene has several feathers in his cap, though he didn't want me to introduce so much about him. Well, I'll make it very short, including international uh, fellowships, research, academia, and several, several publications. The most interesting part about Dr. Abhay Nene is that he himself is a very passionate sports enthusiast, and he actively participates in cycling events and marathons regularly. So he's absolutely the right person for us to have here today. And he will guide us completely on how to prevent back injuries while running. And even for those with back pain, how they can manage their condition and you know prevent further progression. So thank you so much, so much, Dr. Nene, for joining us. A little word about Sorgen. We are into compression socks and stockings uh, from say 20, 25 years when the healthcare business. And uh, one of our range is the sports range with uh, compression socks, calf sleeves, and ankle products. And we came across meeting a lot of you uh, passionate and enthusiastic runners. And we found that a lot of injuries are, uh, you know, you are prone to these kind of injuries. And so being a responsible healthcare company, we requested Dr. Abhay Nene. And within a second, he agreed to come and share his years of knowledge with us. Thank you, sir, for being here. And all over to you. Uh, so basically, I have a claimer and a disclaimer. My claimer is that I have run uh, every half marathon that uh, Mumbai has offered from day one. I um I've run all over the world. I've I've done maybe you know just under fifty half marathons. I'm a, a long distance cyclist. Wow. And I'm uh, fifty two, and I still try to keep myself fit. Uh, playing games like I play cricket and tennis, and I do regular uh, you know gym workouts. And as you can see, I have a moonlight rock band also. My disclaimer, I think, is far more important that I'm a Thakela runner. I'm like my best ever half marathon time has been 154. And today at 51, I'm uh, running at 220 and that kind of stuff. I'm literally not a good runner, but I like to do it because of all the benefits that we'll discuss. So I'm not one of the good runners in the in, in town, but I'm an experienced runner. I've been running for the last um, almost 30 years now. Um, my other disclaimer is that um, I'm here actually not to teach but to learn because I'm told that there are some uh, very smart uh, running trainers in this uh, August gathering. So I'm hoping that this will be a crosstalk rather than a didactic because uh, everyone comes in with their own set of knowledge and experience and it'll be great to discuss this on this forum because everyone will have a different point of view and they will look at this from a different lens. So I'm very eager to see how this rolls on. Achal, yeah. so maybe we could start and maybe if you have, if you know of the coaches that are in the group already, we yes. could, uh, you know, use them to uh, add their, um, you know, add to their, uh, add to the uh, discussion. Correct. Correct. So we'd like to have this as an um, interactive discussion more than a proactive. So if you can put your questions, I've already seen Santosh Kakade's question, um, uh, you know, what to do with a degen arthritis. So maybe we could do that. All right. So uh, maybe a slight brief before we get into specific questions. So I just have three, four questions, uh, which are kind of common questions. If we take them first, and then we could have the specific ones and coaches are there and more are joining in as well. So like, uh, Doctor, if we may begin with what are the pros and cons of running? So um, I think everyone who's here agrees that running is probably the greatest sport on earth. It's the simplest, easiest sport to uh, practice. It, um, uh, you know, it's a it's a free willing sport. You can just run anywhere on earth, wherever you are. You literally don't even need shoes if you want to run. And it's the most natural, organic form of exercise. So I think uh, that is the big pro. Uh, in technicalities, it's a great cardiovascular exercise, which means that it helps your heart uh, function at a higher level. 
So it makes it healthier. It trains your heart in a way. It uh, trains your muscles. It's a muscle building, um, uh, uh, you know, exercise. It's a loading exercise. So it's good for your bones and your muscles because your musculoskeletal structure, the columns and the beams in your body are actually biological, which means that they respond to stress. So if uh, the body is loaded, the muscles and the bones get stronger. So it helps prevent things like sarcopenia and osteoporosis. Uh, it also is great for circulation, as you know, and we may discuss this later, especially uh, uh, regards to the compression stockings that you'll make, that the peripheral heart, like you all may have wondered why, you know, how does blood go back to the heart? Anti-gravity, what is the system? Here the heart pumps and the blood goes out. But what's pushing it back? So those are your, the muscles, actually. Your blood vessels are trapped in muscles and the muscles groups, when they, when they contract, they push the blood back. So it's a great activity for um uh, you know for circulation also and of course for mental health i think all of you would agree that you if you've had a good run in the morning you're the king of the day the whole day goes well for you because all the happy hormones get released you look at everything in a positive manner and you start finding solutions i mean most of my solutions have been found on the long run you wow. see so these are all the pros there are there are a few cons i think the the big con is that it's a high impact sport it is not a low impact activity like cycling which means that the recovery time can be higher. It is you're more prone to injuries, and um, the the muscles and the bones do take a beating at the end of a long run. Like you can't do back to back long runs compared to cycling. You can do a hundred k every day for a week, and you know still get away. Um, the other con is, I mean, apart from being injury prone, is that if you have an injury, like I'm reading in the you know re reading on the chat groups, it can um, you know uh, you know provocate that injury, and you know that's where you know there are some fine lines that you need to work around. True, true. Very well said, doctor. And have, uh, having that being said, who should take up running, in your opinion? So, uh, again, running is a free sport and everyone can run. There is no age limit. There is no, uh, uh, like there's myths, you know, misconceptions that children shouldn't run or old people shouldn't run. These yeah. are all mil misconceptions. I think um, everyone can take up take up running, but you've got to do it in a, in a sustainable manner. You just don't go and hit the road running. Um, um, I think the, the bigger question is who should not take up running. And I think um, if I think anyone who's below 25, I'm going to call that young, is okay. normally assumed to be healthy and you're okay to go. But anyone right, at 50, if you're to start running, you want to make sure that your um, you know heart function is okay. Your knees are fine. You don't have meniscus injuries. Your you know osteoporosis status is not too good. Mm -hmm. But uh, the short answer to your question is that everyone can run. Very interesting. Doctor, in your vast practice of sort of so many years, 28 years, you must have seen a lot of uh, runners uh, as patients. So what are the most commonest injuries, running injuries that you might have seen in your practice so, so far? So this is the season actually, in Mumbai, being practicing in Mumbai. Um, uh, this is the season about when, uh, you know, winter sets in and the marathon is around the corner. You'll see that our roads, I live on Pedder Road. So this is the arterial oh. road where <laughs> all the runners cross. So right. every morning you get out and you're happy to see, you know, more and more people running. The Correct. problem is that many of us are time crunched and we tend to suddenly crank up our mileage and our, uh, you know, training uh, acutely, like in a short span. We don't, you know, spread it over. It, ideally, you should be running all year long. But uh, when you suddenly crank up your mileage, it can lead to injuries. The commoner injuries, of course, are lower down. That's the foot, the ankle coming up to the shin and then the knee. And mm -hmm. then leading up to the hip and the back. So that's right. the sequence. I think amongst the commonest would be ankle strains, uh, you know, foot strains, um, shin splints, runner's knees. I think these are the most common of the injuries that you see. Though yeah. uh, being a back surgeon, I exclusively end up seeing a lot of back injuries, including disc injuries, slip discs, you know, mm -hmm. stress fractures in the back, stress fractures in the SI joints. Uh, so there's a whole plethora of injuries and maybe we could go over a few symptoms and right. you know, easy ways to diagnose them. Yes, that would be interesting. And uh, what about the common mistakes or misconceptions, you know, that amateur runners harbor? Uh, so, you know, I'm, I mean, my tagline here, and I, I hope that everyone can take this as a take-home message to tell all your friends, is that there are the three things that can contribute to running or to running injury-free running, sorry, is um, uh, fitness, form, and fatigue. If you think about that in, in that triangle, so fitness means that... Um, Look, when you're 18 and you're springy and you're upright, your muscles are nice and flexible, your cartilages are nice and spongy. So you can take an impact sport. Your heart is willing to accept more load and it's, it's going to re respond to that. So you're in that growing responsive age. So you can just go out and run. But um, 
after a certain age you need to be fit to run mm-hmm. so you need to have a amount of fitness otherwise running will actually injure you more than uh, make you fit you see so the first is fitness and again we can talk about it but what i'm actually alluding to is that running is not a panacea running is great for cardiovascular great for lower body but you need to build your trunk you need to work on strength training including upper body strength training leg strength training so uh, you need to work on your weight for example if you're overweight so that's mm-hmm. one common thing that you see that uh, you know 3 4 years i i was w- busy with my business i gained 10 kilos but i was an ex runner so i said okay i'm going to this year i'm going to make make that change and start running right run with 10 kilos excess on my body the you know the the load on my knees and my back gets multiplied and the chance of injury is a higher so you got to optimize your weight by diet and through low impact exercises and maintain it through running running is not a great uh, workout for an overweight person so okay. all this falls into fitness and of course nutrition and rest like if you're not uh, consuming adequate nutrition which means your muscles are not getting replenishment you mm-hmm. we all know that exercise actually damages muscles it doesn't build muscle Mm-hmm. the building happens with the rest and the nutrition so if you damage 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 but don't you know rest enough or don't do enough nutrition then your muscles are actually going to get catab- catabolic they start you start losing muscle mass and that's again not a good thing so right. fitness form is how you run so when you run and again you know all the experts in the group will know that you have to have the posture of running you have to be running tall your hips should be pulled down your chin should be up um, your shoulders should be relaxed you should be breathing appropriately from your nose and from your mouth you should be uh, counting your breaths you should not huff and puff when you run you should pace down so that you can uh, you know have an easy your cadence is important how you step these are little more technical uh, details when you step your uh, knee should never cross your body so you should slightly fall forward and run but definitely mm-hmm. not fall back but not fall too forward also right. so this is the form of running and if your form is faulty then you're prone to injuries Uh, for example uh, there are runners who fall a lot forward when they run and they are prone to neck trapezius injuries they are prone to uh, uh, ankle injuries people who run back who, who are you know overstepping as we say mm-hmm. uh, you know they're hitting much ahead of their uh, cadence they tend to have uh, injuries for the hip and sometimes the front of the knee so form can definitely make a difference and then fatigue so fatigue means um, um it's common sense that your muscles have a certain capacity at a given time and of course you build on it but today if my capacity is x the minute i exceed that capacity the muscles going to function lesser less optimally and a less yeah. optimally functioning muscle is more prone to injury because it's not supporting you anymore so yeah. when, you're, when you're a 10k runner you don't want to crank it up to 18k on one day you want to build it up because when you build up and rest and build up and rest your muscle takes that level of fitness and then at 18k you don't get injuries but the common problems that we find in runners like recently i had a guy with a disc in the thoracic spine who suddenly ran a 20k he said i've been running every year so it was okay i'm not practiced this time i had no time i just went and ran a 20k and that doesn't go up because he's fit but his muscles are right now not tuned so they get fatigued at 78k and then after that it's all downhill so i think these are the three uh, important take homes and i'm happy to uh, you know if anyone in the audience has any uh, yes. you know anything to add on this Yes. Would anybody like to add uh, on these three things that doctor just mentioned? I think uh, Mr. Dilip Patil has uh, raised his hand. Uh, may I unmute him, doctor? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, everyone can be unmuted. It's all okay. all. Yes. Video is good because they are Mr. all great Dilip guys. Patil, you can please uh, ask your question. You are unmuted. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, actually, I am a patient. I have visited you many times. Oh. Of course. uh for my back problem yes yes but uh, uh, right now i am okay and i am uh, running you know I, i did my comrades also last year big big, big runner i know <laughs> so the problem is uh, the many runners after some time they start inqu- uh, inquiring uh, uh, whether he should use a knee cap if i, uh, I don't know oh, at which stage one should start using the so, knee cap so uh, it's a very good question dilip ji and me tumhala i'll explain you in the scientific uh, manner that a knee cap is actually a myth there is no advantage of wearing a knee cap over not wearing it so it is not necessary for us to at after a certain age to start wearing a knee cap i'll tell you what the knee cap does and what the problem of the knee is so in your knee the uh, when we run if you know the knee cap which is the patella the bone has to track 
when you run. So your the the lower part of your thigh, which is the femur bone, the patella glides on it every time you flex and extend your leg. Some of us with when we develop our quadriceps, I, I would I would say most of us, our quadriceps, which is our thigh muscle, is bulky on the outside and less bulky on the inside. So the quadriceps, which is well developed, has a tendency to pull the kneecap outward when we run. And this is this causes a wear out of the undersurface of the kneecap, the patella, the, the bone. And that wear out gives you what is called a runner's knee. And the simple formula for preventing this is um, to strengthen the small muscle called the VMO, the vastus medialis oblicus, by a very specific exercise. You'll find it on YouTube. And that balances this big muscle from pulling it off. So re retracking the patella is the treatment. What a kneecap does is that ideally a kneecap with a hole for the bone, it tries to artificially do this. But in reality, it's been shown that with or without a kneecap, if you bend the knee and do an x-ray, it's not going to make any difference. So what else it does, it gives you proprioceptive feedback, which means that if you're running and I put, put my hand on your back, you'll automatically straighten up. Proprioception, your mind goes there. So similarly, mm -hmm. a kneecap does that. But in return, a kneecap makes you slightly addicted to it. And uh, if you don't have a kneecap, which is correct, for example, if the kneecap is too tight or if it doesn't have a hole through which yeah. the, knee, the knee bone can come out, uh, it can actually compress the knee and it can be actually bad for you. So the short answer to your question is that nobody should wear a kneecap. Very interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, Mr. Dilip, does that answer your question or you have anything else which you'd no, like yes. to ask? No, I'm okay. Great. Thank uh, you. Santosh ji has a question in the chat yeah. box. He um, said, uh, Santosh, are you there? Santosh Kakade. Mr. Santosh, uh, I'll just, uh, Renuka, if you can just unmute Mr. Santosh. And just answer the question because he's typed the question there already. Right, yes. right. So Mr. Santosh has asked the question that he has a mild uh, degenerative changes in his left knee joint, also mild patella articular surface irregularity and what should he do? So that's exactly, Santoshi, what we discussed right now. The patella undersurface is the mild tracking. So I think, uh, again, the short answer to your question is that you should work harder on strengthening the muscles around your knee, which is your quadriceps, the VMO, and then the hamstrings. And any good running physio can teach you that. Uh, YouTube has good exercises to strengthen the knee, but you work slightly harder on the knee. What that does is if the muscles are stronger, they divert the load on the knee. Each time we run, there's a load that hits the knee and that's what causes the wear out. If the muscles around the knee are strong, they try they, they become harnesses that take the load off. So uh, again, it, uh, I want to break two common myths. One myth is that a person with degenerative arthritis cannot run. That's wrong because uh, degenerative arthritis is like get, say, saying like you got gray hair. There are various grades of it. I'm 100% sure that today if you do an x-ray of a 50-year-old guy, it's going to show arthritis. But that doesn't mean that it's not age compatible. So if it's not symptomatic, which means if you're not hurting, you're good to run. The other misconception is that running causes arthritis. That has been systematically proven to be incorrect and uh, studies have shown that runners actually, so uh, again, interestingly, the cartilage, which is the part that takes the load of the knee, uh, takes its nutrition by loading. So if you've been loading your cartilage, there's a higher chance that your cartilage is healthy. Now, the problem is that if you have a meniscus injury, so meniscus, menisci are small discs in your knee, which allow you some gliding and rotating movement. Mm -hmm. uh, if they are injured, they can get ground down because they don't have a blood supply. They don't have a regeneration potential like the muscle has. So in short, if you have a meniscal injury or a ligament tear, you may want to work your way through this and not just go out running. But with what you have, mild degenerative changes in the left knee with mild patella articular surfaces, just focus on knee exercises and go out there and run and keep your body weight optimum. If your body weight has gone up, up even muscle weight, then the knee is going to take that much more. And of course, you know the running dynamics try to run with the, you know, the, the knee should actually fall in line with the ankle when you run. I mean, I'm sure you know that. But if the knee is falling back or falling way forward, it will get overloaded. These are the mechanics that you got to remember. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Mr. Santosh, would you like to ask something further? There are many other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So I think uh, we have question from uh, Coach Anil and I think Ashutosh has said that Coach yeah. Anil wants to ask a question. 
and compression socks helps in varicose veins. Do you want to answer that? There's a question. I think that that might be. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, compression socks do help in varicose veins, and as doctor mentioned about the blood circulation and the veins having to, uh, you know, pump the blood against gravity. And that's how sometimes there is collection or pooling of blood in the lower limbs of the body. And compression socks help to apply that external pressure and helps the valves close, uh, you know, together. And that's how, and it's a graduated compression. So they apply maximum pressure at the ankle. And as you move up to the, you know, calf area, the pressure reduces. And that's how the blood circulation is improved. So definitely compression socks help varicose veins and in sports as well, it finds a great application in performance as well as muscle recovery post the run. And we have a lot of... For you, medically, medically, compression stockings is the treatment for varicose veins, actually. Right. It's the first treatment for varicose veins and I'm going to say 80 to 90% of people with varicose veins that are moderately symptomatic, they will completely get solved by specific uh, exercises and compression stockings. They don't need surgery. So I think I'm just butting in. I'm sorry, but to yeah, break, no, no, doctor. I mean, it's yeah, it, it's, uh, it's it's right. I mean, rightfully answered by you, uh, basically. Yeah. Because uh, uh, in in varicose veins, the veins become dilla. They lose, so the blood tends to pool. The veins don't tighten up to push the blood back, and that's exactly what compression stockings do. They tighten up the veins, and they don't allow pooling, peripheral pooling of bad blood, which contains pain substances, deoxygenated blood, which makes your muscles more tired. So one yeah. of the fundas of wearing compression stockings while running is that it takes away all the used up blood back and the muscles can get, you know, good blood coming in. So I think those are the two, you know, key ingredients for com compression stockings. On the flip side, I must say, I though, you know, though um, uh, the, the sponsors of the seminar are, <laughs> must know. know that there's a, a, a syndrome of, um, uh, um, uh, what's it? The muscle fascia syndrome, compartment syndrome. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So compartment syndrome. If you're wearing too tight stockings, or if your compartment is too tight, it can actually work in the reverse way. It can even start blocking the arterial supply, the good supply. So when right. you wear compression stockings, the you must, you should wear it, but you should ease into it. You should get the right size, and that's where Anchal and her uh, team comes into play. They scientifically tell you your size, and you got to wear it intermittently, and then start wearing it more frequently. Ease into it. And do not forget doing your calf and your soleus exercises along with using the compression stockings. So if you, you know, complete the whole circle, it's it's a no-brainer. Yes. And that is why we emphasize uh, a lot on sizing. And we ensure that, you know, so many times we have uh, people say, oh, I have the socks. I gave it to my relative. You know, she had come. And I said, but you cannot do that. It has to be tailor I mean, given as per your size. And you can't, it's not one size fits all. So as you rightly said, if it's too tight, it's it's going to be harmful. And if it's too loose, it's not doing the job it's supposed to do in any case. So sizing so, play. Uh, actually, there's a question on uh, runner's high. Right. And again, runner's high, uh, I, I must elaborate that whenever we do a very high cardiac activity, so it's not only running, it's I cycle. So I know I mount, uh, I climb mountains. So I know even, even those high cardiac output activities they tend to release happy hormones in the brain. These are called serotonins and endorphins mm -hmm. that make you feel happy, make you feel strong and confident. I think all of you who have done those Sunday long runs, you mm -hmm. know your Sunday goes much better than the other days because you're like on top of the game. So runner's high specifically alludes to a point in your long run where these enzymes take over and mm -hmm. you start feeling a feeling of well-being and the pain start to you know, slow down and you start feeling like, oh, now I'm going to be able to take the next... 10 kilometers without a without a fault and uh, which is actually a good thing because that's actually a positive feedback gives you because you you know the running is as mental as it is physical uh, i know you've also mentioned that is is there a, is it harmful so really it cannot be harmful because at most you will you know attack the run little harder but um, if you're in that run you're obviously trained enough to for example if you're doing a 21k run and at 14k, you get a runner's high. And from 14 to 16, because of the high, you're pounding harder. You will still be able to finish your 21. So I would say that you got to use your runner's high to optimize your performance. But I must say that it's not a rule that everyone gets a runner's high. So a lot of runners start running and say, I do high nahi aare. But that's not true. You may not get it at, on in a given run. And overall, it's a good thing. Right. So, uh, right. should we just go on with the questions? Because Yes, I'm, yes. We have a question from Akshay Kate on how to recover from shin splints. 
Yes. Uh, Akshay, are you there in the room? And if he is, we shall unmute him. Yes, he's there. Akshay, would you like to ask your question on your own? Akshay, you can unmute Hello. yourself. Hello, yeah. I'm audible. Hello. Yes. 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 Uh, so, oh, this is a. Uh, uh, Hello. Yes. I'm audible. Yes. 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 Very much. Uh, is uh, uh, helps to recover from shin split because uh, from two to three months I'm facing on a shin split. Uh, and while we, I mean, like, uh, in starting, I have to face struggle while running. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, Akshay. So uh, I, is, huh. I can elaborate on what a shin splint actually is. So uh, when we run, you know that our legs are not absolutely straight. When all of you stand in front of the mirror, you'll see that when you join your legs, there's a slight bowing that is inherent, fifteen degrees on either side. So the center of gravity is on the inside rather than on the outside. So when you draw that line, the shin falls in line with that center of gravity, which means that the shin, which is the inner, inner bony part of your leg, is a highly loaded bone when you run. And the harder, harder you run, the more it gets loaded. Now, if it gets overloaded, which means that you're, the, what we were alluding to in the beginning, that if your capacity is so much and you've suddenly started doing this, you have not graduated into loading. So you load, you let it recover, let it get stronger, load little more and let it, let that cycle run. Then it's all good. But if you suddenly overload um, either distances or hills, uh, the, there's an overloading stress on the um, shin. And these are actually, you, you might find it hard to believe, but they are micro fractures in the bone. Small cracks start to develop. These are stress fractures of the bone. So uh, they present themselves as um, pain in the shin as you increase running. It's not the first step that's painful, but the more you run, the more painful it will get. And unfortunately, the treatment is to cut down on the running, get back to your comfort zone. Uh, actually, I would say three, four weeks, you should go off running if you're consistently getting shin splints. Because see, you've got to run all your life. So it's okay if you want to pull, if right. you need to pull back for a few weeks and you should think of the long game. All of us have had it. We've all been through that cycle. So pull back for a few weeks, consume calcium and vitamin D robustly and work on muscle exercises and get your cardio from low impact, like get cycling. It's a great low impact activity to keep your cardio status going and then build up on your runs. The only other thing that can affect shin splints is the shoes. So uh, if your shoes are worn out and you're running with, you know, either the shoes falling this way or that way, Again, that can, you know, uh, worsen the load on the shin and that can cause a shin. So look after these two and then you can get back to running. Uh, does that answer your question, Akshay? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Great. Uh, we have some more people who raised their hands. So there's Yogendra Vyas. Uh, Yogendra, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Mr. Yogendra, are you in? Okay. While we wait for... For him, we can take the next question in the chat box. Uh, there's if somebody asking with, uh, whether we should run with the mouth open or closed. Uh, do you have that's any? A, that's a great question because there's no good answer. But okay. I'll tell you the the funda around it. Okay, so there's a South American saying that says that if you run with your mouth open, it's like drinking water from a dirty pond, because you're designed to breathe from your nose. When the air goes through your nose, there are a bunch of filters that are designed to filter out the bad air and moisture, moisturizes the air before it actually goes into the lung. So ideally, all of us should be breathing from our nose. Right. Now, if you're breathing from your nose, you're far too comfortable. Means you're not pushing your cardiovascular also. You see? So uh, you need to have air hunger when you run, which means that uh, to wash out the, you know, the carbon dioxide that builds up in your muscles and in your lungs, you need to have a lot of air coming in. And when you do... And when you do, you know, you can take much more air when you gulp through your mouth. So it yeah. should be a combination of nose and mouth. It's easier said than done. All I'm saying is that you should not be, you should not be doing that. Neither should be, you should be, which means force your lips and just force that no, uh, you know, nose to do the work. Right. And you should have that somewhere in between. Um, the two more tricks I would like to say is that if you're running and you're not able to talk with your partner, you're probably doing too much of mouth breathing. So you should worry about it. And the old ancient yogic message that run, uh, breathe through your abdomen and not your chest. And that's something, that's a trick that all of you should apply. I apply it in high altitude mountaineering also. So when you breathe in, typically our 
our uh, in uh, instinct is to do right so when we this is called chest breathing but try doing this where you're sitting right now that when you breathe in you push your stomach out you can't see my chest moving but my stomach is coming out when i breathe in so when you do abdominal breathing the second one that i showed you you can take in much more air per breath because your diaphragm gets pushed down and that's the reason why the abdomen comes out and you can uh, you your you can optimize your oxygen intake for a limited number of breaths so these are the two takeaways from your question and i'm glad you brought this question on the table because nobody talks about it great thank you so much you explained that so beautifully doctor uh, we have another question from mr mahesh uh, dujje i am allow i'm unmuting you mr mahesh if you are there you can ask your question directly uh, mr mahesh yes yes achal thank you uh, hi doctor uh, happy new year uh, actually uh, uh, i have started running a year back only and uh, uh few years back i had uh, uh, high uric acid issue due to which uh, my left knee was swollen very badly so uh, uh, recently what i observed when now uh, i mean i do 10k very easily now i am trying to push for 15 and uh, ahead so what happens uh, 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 most of the time at the end my left knee i feel that it's something uh bloating feeling in my knee so uh, and uh, after uh, it, it won't stop me from running but definitely that uh, uncomfort feel is there and after running uh, for an hour uh, moment of knee i feel like it's uh, it's having i i don't uh, move my knee freely i mean i feel that floating is that bloating is still there so what's the cause and how can we avoid it uh, and uh, can i ask you how old you are mahesh I'm thirty six now. Yeah, so you're not in that characteristic age group of arthritis. Uh, yeah. You must know that uric acid is a dietary problem. It's nothing to do yeah. with arthritis. So yeah. when you're consuming certain food and your body is certainly unregulated into excreting uric acid, it mm -hmm. crystallizes. Like when you have too much salt in your water, the crystals form. These crystals tend to go and sit inside joints. Now they mm -hmm. commonly sit in small joints, not in the big joint. So if mm -hmm. you actually had a knee that was swollen you may want to rethink whether it was uric acid because when someone says i have high uric acid i'm going to think his toes are swollen the commonest one is the second toe which gets swollen sometimes the fingers but the knee and the hips are not known to be suckers for uric acid yeah. let's assume yeah. for the minute that this was a uric acid related uh, arthritic uh, problem i think mm -hmm. the uh, uh, it as soon as the uric acid goes down it it leaves your system and the knee is fine so one mm -hmm. thing you got to check is whether your uric acid is currently a normal mm -hmm. and uh, you, yeah yeah after that incident uh, i was very cautious about my diet and ne i never had any incident like that but uh, have you been but, checking your uric acid levels yes i mean they been last, normal yeah it's it's uh, either in the normal range or uh, to the close to the higher so not uh, crossing that uh, normal range so again just a uh, pro tip is that uh, though the normal range is 6 Uh, in vegetarians, it should be five or below, and in meat okay. eaters, six is acceptable. So, if as a vegetarian, if mine is reaching six, I would still call it high, and it, all it takes to is to give tablets. Now, let's say all this is done, and you still mm -hmm. complain of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I would just caution you to say that you continue running, uh, do the mm -hmm. common sense stuff of icing your knee before and after mm -hmm. the stretching and icing before and after, strengthen the muscles around the knee. and if mm -hmm. you still feel that look this is still becoming an impediment and i want to get this cleared an mm -hmm. mri scan of your knee which actually will show you the soft tissues so sometimes residual <clears throat> uric acid is still there in the soft tissues and that's mm -hmm. the cause of the problem where you once you know your enemy you may decide that the enemy is too big and i want to pull back or the enemy is just making its presence felt but i'm going to run through this so okay. that's how i would think for uh, if i was you mahesh okay Okay. So I mean, don't. It's not you. serious, but it's something that if you want to run for the next twenty, thirty years, you may want to get it out out of your system. Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking that way only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Lovely. Lovely. So Kapil has a question. I think you're muted, Archil. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I said uh, we have a next question from Kapil Rathi. <clears throat> he says he has a mild pain above the heel at the right leg laterally increases after a long run and then it goes off so so heel pain can be a huge problem but the problem heel pain is not laterally the problem heel pain is a uh, couple you're there so you may uh, you know even unmute and talk talk to us 
The problem one is the one that comes at the under surface of the heel, which is plantar fasciitis. And worse is at the back of the heel, actually is tendinitis. So mm -hmm. if you don't have any of this, you specifically say it's on the lateral side. The commonest reason for that is inversion of the leg or, or of the foot when you run. So when you run, if your feet are not falling straight, but they're slightly inverting, either because of the mechanics of your running or because the shoe is inadequate or inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, so you must know that the commoner problem is this. Pronation or flat foot is the commoner problem in runners. But this can also happen. If this happens, the outer or the lateral side of the heel will hurt. And all you need to do is lateral muscle strengthening exercises, which means if assuming this is your foot, there mm -hmm. are muscles on the side, which are like harnesses, the ones on the outside. So if you push a ball, like an exercise ball with your foot, or if you tie a rubber band and push a pull against it, you will strengthen the outside of your, uh, of your um, ankle. And that will take care of the problem. And of course, look at your shoes. Just keep your shoes neutrally and see if they're falling off or if they're absolutely fine. The general rule of thumb is that, uh, you know, after every, I'm going to say 600 kilometers, you should change your shoe because they are not designed for anything more than that. And you, they start wearing, which means that the, um, the sole no longer remains absorbing and then you've lost the battle. So I hope I answer your question there. Right. That was, that was very insightful, actually. So we don't take, you know, uh, notice of the shoes how long uh, you know it's been worn for we have next question, an interesting question from Nidhi. Nidhi's question yeah, is very, very interesting question from Nidhi. she's going to yeah. start running her marathons and hasn't joined any marathon yet so she wants you to suggest something yeah so, so i think what Nidhi is she's echoing the uh, question that every beginner would ask though i'm sure she's not a beginner and she's a pro runner but anyone who wants to get into running must remember the rules of running that number one, you should have cardiovascular fitness, which means you prove to yourself that you're able to do six kilometers an hour of walking. So walking at a pace of minimum 10 minute kilometer. Okay. Anything higher than that is okay. And sustainable for an hour, at least three or four times a week, at least for a couple of months and have ideally heart rate monitor and see how that's going to tick off your cardiovascular fitness before you even start running. You should ensure that your weight is optimum, which means that in your last five or 10 years, whatever your weight was fluctuating, it should be at its lowest best. And you should ensure that you're doing strength training for the trunk, abdomen, back, side, glutes, hamstrings, quadriceps, and calves uh, for a good enough time before you actually break into running. So that becomes your basic requirement before you even say that I want to run. Once you started running um, to, to do a half marathon, I'm going to say, because I've been through this myself, uh, you know, from a 5K runner, I became a half marathoner when the TMM first announced their uh, half marathon. We were all excited back then. So uh, you want to, uh, you know, up your mileage by a maximum of 10% every fortnight, not more than that. So which means that you will need to have a six month training time before you do your first half marathon. Once you've reached that, then you'll develop your own rhythm. So most of us who've been running for a long time, uh, normally use uh, like three months of training to break into a half marathon because all year we're still running 7, 10K, you know, even in summers and otherwise we're cycling. So I think, I, I hope I have answered your question. One easy way to do it is that you do a brisk walk, slow run, brisk walk, slow run and do that for two hours. Like get out on a Sunday and, you know, maybe uh, do a very brisk walk seeing that your heart rate is hitting 100, 120 and then break into a slow run for maybe half of like 500 meters and again do a brisk walk for 500 and then slowly join the run the peaks of the running and make make it compatible. That was very, very insightful. Nidhi, are you here? Would you like to ask something? Uh, well, we'll move on uh, to the next question. <clears throat> and the next question is by somebody who says that what is the solution for hamstring injury? I always have pain in my right ham hamstring while running and shifted to different muscles while running. Yeah, so uh, hamstring is the most used muscle when you run. Uh, running is a hamstring heavy exercise. Cycling is a quadriceps heavy exercise. So your hamstring is hurting. There's something wrong because it's the main mover when you run. So again, uh, going back to a similar answer to what the other, well, the, your glute strength determines how your hamstrings are going to function. So you sometimes have to strengthen your glutes more. But basically, I'm alluding to strengthening of the hamstring. So again, a very oversimplified answer is their hamstrings are hurting. They are not able to cope with the amount of load that you're putting on them. So you cut down the load on the hamstrings. It doesn't mean you want to stop running, but get your uh, mileage down to a less 
or non painful status and strengthen hamstring by doing hamstring curls by doing glute you know glute exercises they're all over the internet or we've got yeah. great physios you know in our team or in bombay who are runners themselves who can teach you great exercises to strengthen the hip and the hip controls the hamstring so um if you strengthen that and then inch back to running that's your best bet the worst would be that you keep running through a painful hamstring and then something gets injured because then the once a muscle gets injured yes. it contracts and then you know a fibrous kind of a healing happens and that becomes a chronic injury then uh, right. pro runners need shots before every run and it's quite a it's not a fun thing to have so if it's right. giving you a signal just respond to it and i must say that you must get your form also analyzed again it's about how you're hitting your foot sometimes the form is bad and your uh, you know the way the recoil is going is not good so uh, all the good runner stores and we unfortunately we don't have a lot in india but abroad mm -hmm. uh, you, when you run on a treadmill and you know look uh, getting video recorded uh, you will see what your form is and you know which part of your um, foot is actually taking a long uh, more weight the atharva okay. ability in bkc has this facility atharva ability that's a good place yeah. to go right so when there is pain ideally one should not be running until you resolve it with strengthening and exercising yeah. right yeah. okay we have a next question by somebody where it says that sometimes experience rips in the upper back what could be the reason for it this is by amit so amit i'm assuming you're meaning here and not here because if this is hurting assuming it's again both sides and not of course if it's the left then you got to really worry but if it's the ribs in the front it's about your breathing mechanics but typically this is what hurts and the commonest cause of the upper back uh, hurting after a run is your head drops off so when oh. you run your head is not being controlled so you have to remember to chin up and run so run tall as we say chin up the second cause is that your shoulders keep doing this when you run which with especially as you run more mileage and they get fatigued so a simple trick for that is that in the middle of your run throw your hands up and run the minute you throw your hands up you have activated your traps and they pull themselves together to hold your shoulder up if the traps are weak this will happen or the traps are fatigued so most of us in say at five, after 5k after every at every k you know a few 100 meters throw your hands up for a few steps or do a reverse stretch while running it's all easily possible so i think these are the two two things that you got to worry about that's a wonderful trip a uh, tip for just putting your hands up in the air that's that's yeah. that wonderful yeah. we have another question uh, which says um, can a high grade medial collateral ligament yes. injury near the femoral yeah. after yeah. taking rest and recovery by physio can run fast so uh, the answer is yes you can uh, because most footballers have had this but you must have a definition of this injury because if this injury is a complete tear you need to have it stitched before you want to get into any impact sport but if it's a strain so remember the difference strain is like if you take a cloth and just keep pulling on it a few fibers may get undone but the cloth is intact this is recoverable so it takes 3 weeks or 4 weeks for the injury to re resolve after that you start working on the inside muscles to overcome that we weakened ligament and you can get back to running but if it's a tear it's not compatible with running because then each time you run the knee will keep dislocating or subluxating and it will mm -hmm. lead to disaster so an mri scan would tell you what what is the grade of this uh, it basically is a sprain or a tear and mm -hmm. if it's a tear then you got to get it fixed then running is a bad idea great okay. there is a question from mr dharmesh which he's asking cramps elaborate i'm assuming yeah 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 so cramps is a common thing that happens basically cramps is when the muscles have finished their quota of uh, nutrition right so say my biceps has 100 amounts of nutrition and i keep doing biceps curls and that nutrition gets finished right uh, after that the muscle will start cramping cramping indicates ind indicates fatigue lack of glycogen available in that muscle and hence the uh, mechanism is quite curious i wish i could tell you that it's like a it's like a lever system that contracts a muscle but mm -hmm. that gets activated because of accumulation of the p substances and your muscle goes into a cramp the treatment while a cramp is happening is you yeah. know what you want to stop using that muscle i say it lightly massage it gradually stretch it and suck through that pain because there's you can can't really do much but mm -hmm. to prevent cramps yes. you got to exercise the muscle in the good time stretch the muscle adequately so stretching and exercising uh, pre run and sometimes in the middle of the run i mean personally one of oh. my pro tips is that when i'm running if it's a longer distance in the middle of the run you will see me doing high knees like hopping or 
uh, you know, trying to butt kick, like donkey kicks while running. So you suddenly oh. like uh, upset your rhythm and do high knees or donkey kicks. So you're ending up stretching your quads or your hamstrings while you're running. So that yeah. tends to help and make sure that your vitamin D intake is adequate. That's interesting. Okay, so Amit said, disregard the last question. He gets pain in the ribs after an intense long run. And what could be the reason? So for again, that? Amit, I'm assuming that the ribs means your the, the whole rib cage and it's not this. So if ribs hurt when you run, what happen, What do the ribs do when you're running? The ribs are doing... Just switch to abdominal running. What I, what I mentioned in the beginning. Stop moving your chest and start taking breaths from your stomach. The movement of the rib will reduce and the pain will go away. And make sure that you're taking calcium and vitamin D supplements. Those are the only things that will um, come in the way of rib pain while running. Otherwise, there's no reason to get rib pain when you run. Right. We have a next question from Anjali Deshmukh. Uh, Anjali, if you're here, you can ask. She says, what will you... Yeah, Anjali, please ask your question. Anjali? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Very much. I have unmuted. Yes. So, good evening, everyone. And happy new year. Uh, I am a super... I'm gynecologist. I've done uh, Rendonier event, super Rendonier. So, one question you have solved about kneecap. Another question I want to ask that should we use additional arch sole, foot arch sole, yeah. uh, additional which is given in shoes, customized. So, it's a great because, question, Anjali. And because uh, everyone's uh, this arch is different, and uh, the shoes, the company shoes which, uh, which we use, uh, they are one for all. <laughs> which we select according to our art. But should we use this customized self? Yeah. So it's a good question, very insightful question. You've thought about this and being a gynecologist yourself. I think, you know, you have the aces up your sleeve. I must tell you this interesting experiment that was conducted, being an orthopod, you know, we've read about this, that they made people jump from 10 feet using um, arch sole, like a great sole, big padding and, and an arch support and others barefoot. And the impact on the knee and the back was evaluated and it was lesser in people who actually jumped on the barefoot sole. Okay, so your uh, foot, as you know, has like 22 or 25 muscles and like as many number of joints. So it's a very pliable structure. It's not like, and a, a shoe can actually imprison this pliability, which is supposed to be the shock absorption mechanism of your foot. So uh, it's not necessary that a good footwear will actually take the load off your... It's it's something that companies sell to you. And that is where barefoot running came into play. And personally, most of my running shoes are barefoot shoes, like with zero, zero sole, like zero drop, zero support. Now, to okay. answer your question specifically, uh, if you're not hurting when you run, so whatever your foot is, you may have a flat foot also. Like when you look at it, it looks like a flat foot. But if you run and your foot does not hurt, you do not need any additional supplemental supports. You can just run with what you use. There's a big myth that if you're flat feet, they are 80% of flat feet are asymptomatic. So they don't have any symptoms. So the question comes only if you are hurting in your soul or you're getting plantar fasciitis or Ach Achilles tendinitis. And now you see, oh, maybe I have flat feet. You know, so if there's a symptom, if there's a problem, you start looking for a solution. Now here, the you know, the easy thing to say is that if you have a flat foot, you're tending, your feet are tending to go that way when you run. So you want something that supports this here. Um, okay. uh, this can be customized, but you know, I'm actually talking about two or three percent of people. Only they need this. So they, there are these systems, like I told you about Atharva ability. You stand and it measures how much, you know, uh, how much weight the entire soul is taking, how much the inner is taking and the outer is taking. Ideally, it should be done even when you run, but we don't have a lab for that. And then you can make a uh, customized footwear that can actually support the medial arch. Uh, but yeah. even better, I would say, is you, if you do intrinsic foot muscle exercise, so there are specific exercises, intrinsic foot muscle exercise strengthening. You'll again find it on YouTube. You don't need us to tell you that. Uh, that will take over and you won't need a you know specific support. So I hope I've elaborately answered, uh, Anjali, your question. Yes, yes, sir. One more question. Uh, means... Um... Sir, what is the reason of then numbness and foot cramps we get in long, uh, this cycling also and same in running? Yeah, they're different. Cycling and running, different reasons to get cramps. In running, this is happening. Your foot is arched and every time you impact. So if your muscles are strong, these in intrinsic foot muscles, those cramps will go away. 
And one of the ways is to temporarily change the footwear. But again, it's not a thumb rule that if you're getting cramps, you should wear a support. In fact, for me, by off by taking off the support, my cramps went away. So I moved from supported shoes to zero drop and uh, barefoot shoes. And that, you know, that solved my problem. So it's a bit of trial and error. In cycling, you should not get cramps because cycling is a non-impact sport. So the simple answer is that when you're cycling and you know the pedal should be on the forefoot, it should, in, it should yes. not be on the hind or the midfoot. If you're pushing it on the midfoot, that happens. So again, the simple solution is wear cleats. If you wear cleats, it's a, or at least a hard sole, then no matter where you're pushing the pedal, it doesn't affect your arch. So it's a mistake and, if you're getting cramps while cycling. There's a mistake. And numbness? Foot numbness? No. So numbness? Numbness, is, numbness comes from the same. It's this, it's stretching of the small, small nerves inside the muscles. So don't worry about numbness as a spinal, uh, you know, spinal condition. It's a local problem. As soon as the, you know, muscle cramp goes away, your numbness will get sorted. Uh, sir, one more. Uh, means everyone's, um, this uh, foot is different. Uh, some are tilted in uh, medial side and some are in out outward side. So shoes are support will take care of this. Like I said, no, you don't need to go looking for a solution if there's no problem. Don't look at the shape of your foot and buy shoes. If you're hurting when you run, then you start looking for a solution. So one simple thing is on a frosted mat, if you stand, you'll see how your, how much footprint comes in. And I mean, uh, I think uh, on the ASICS website, all this is given or the Brooks website. And then you can wear either inner supported shoes or outer supported shoes. But basically, you don't have to have a certain type of footwear for a certain type of foot. That is a misconception, which is an industry driven funda. Mm -hmm. Any foot yeah. you can run and uh, you can run barefoot also with any any kind of a foot. As long as it doesn't hurt, you don't look for a solution. Correct. So we'll take the next question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. And thanks, Anjali. Uh, yeah, we have the next question from Mr. Manish Gupta. Yeah, uh, good evening, Dr. Nene. Hi. Yeah. Well, uh... Uh, doctor, uh, like as I have mentioned by this, I have uh, two red flags. I have a chronic lower back ache from the past few years and I have undergone an angioplasty two months back. With proper training and proper guidance, can I target doing a 7 great 10 question. kilometer run great, next year? Great, or great, question. great question. So yeah. both these are conditions that are treatable. You treat yeah. them and you can run a 10K. Okay, again, okay. this is a generic answer. Each one has a specific, uh, you know, situation. So uh, most of the causes of low back pain are degenerative. If there's a specific spondylolisthesis or a nerve compression, we're talking of something else. But the bulk of low back pains or chronic back pains are because of poor ab muscle strength and uh, heavy weight and poor posture. So you mm -hmm. correct that and you can work towards running. So we've had uh, patients who have actually operated who are ultra marathoners, who've gone back right. to ultra marathoning. So back pain is completely compatible with running as long as you treat it. Uh, as far as angioplasty is concerned, angioplasty is done so it fixes the problem. So assuming that you've done it and the problem is fixed, which means okay. that your cardiac function has come back to normal, there's a specific um, method of cardiac rehabilitation. And we have these cardiac rehab specialists who mm -hmm. will ease you into controlled... Get, so you keep a track on your heart rate, you keep a track on your SpO2 and in a controlled manner, get to uh, you know get back to running. But the, the uh, just to give you, uh, you know, some hope, my next door neighbor, who's my age, has had a cardiac bypass at the age of 40. And he's a marathon runner after the bypass. And the cardiologist who I work with has had a bypass himself and he's a full marathoner. Okay. That's that's very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, doctor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, Prashant? Yeah. Uh, we have the next question from Mr. Prashant. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, doctor. Uh, Nene. Uh, I have one question. Uh, of late, uh, I've started getting pain in the inner side of the knee and also inner side of the thigh, left thigh. So, but uh, what is happening is if I continue, if I start running uh, after doing warm up exercise and all, and after completing about uh, one and a half or two kilometers, this pain goes away. And then I'm, I'm able to run a half marathon also. But then again, uh, after I finish the run, that day or the next day, I get this pain again. And uh, I, I do not know whether this is uh, runner's knee or something else. Yeah, this and, is something uh, I else. would request you to tell yeah. me what I should do for this. Runner's knee typically happens in front of the knee. This is something else, Prashant. How old are you, may I ask you? 
I'm 56. And uh, your, this is the first year that you've experienced this pain? Yes, uh, I mean, about uh, two or three months ago, this started. Because it's not happened for 55 years. Uh, but I started running maybe about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, even then, even then. So, yeah, yeah. This you know, is in your time. situation, I must uh, not, I'm not going to paint such a rosy picture that uh, at 56 or even 51, 52 is the age when arthritis starts to happen. Arthritis is the wear and tear of your cartilage. As you know, your knee, I, I spoke about it, that they are not straight, they're slightly bent. So arthritis or damage to the cartilage first happens on the inside of the knee. So anyone who complains of pain on the inside of the knee on a high impact activity is presumed to uh, that he is now getting a symptomatic osteoarthritis. Okay, now this is one piece of information you should have. So mm -hmm. one easy way to know is stand in front of the mirror and see what gap is there between your two between the knees. And if the knees are tending to bow, mm -hmm. you've got to worry. You can get an X-ray and you know get a you know real real view of whether you're getting. A, the short answer is that if there's a strong family history of osteoarthritis in your family, maybe um, it's the time for you to look at shorter runs or um, you know cycling and swimming as uh, great alternatives. Like I personally, after 45, have pitched into cycling as my sport of, uh, like I did the 100K um, uh, cyclothon and this week I'm going to cycle from Chennai to Rameshwar, 750 kilometers. So it gives you great yeah. pleasure. It's like a you know beautiful activity, low impact. And then I will do one half marathon in a year. So I'm saving my knees for that little bit of running, but I'm not doing running as my bulk sport. I do not have a family history of osteoarthritis. So, okay. so then, uh, of I course, know. I overstated the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The simple answer is that you just start working on quadriceps tendoning exercises. Work, okay. Do harder quadriceps workouts before your run. And, uh, you know, pick and choose your run. Try to avoid inclines and declines. Especially declines, try to avoid. Because mm -hmm. that will your knee. And uh, just wing it. Because it's not like a heart attack. You know, you may find that in the next one, two years... It goes away, it went away, or it's building up, and then you can make your own decision. Okay, right. Thank you, doctor. So we have the next question from someone who says that while running downhill or after long distances, after 20 to 20, 25 kilometers, there's a pull in the top of the calf area below the that's back. The, of the that's the gastronemus muscle. The gastronemus, there are two muscles in the calf. Again, they're the main movers when you run. So when you run, you, there's a foot uh, stomp, and then there's a toe off. The toe off is what propels you forward. That toe off activity where the heel pushes your body is handled by the muscles of the calf. One muscle is the soleus, which starts from the leg into the heel. And the other is the gastrocnemus, which starts from the above the knee. So it crosses two joints, crosses the knee as well as the ankle. And that's the muscle that really is giving you the bulk. So if you're getting this pain, you're overworking that muscle. Uh, this right. can again come out of poor muscle strengthening. So we loop back to our first discussion that you strengthen your muscle and then use it to run rather than say that running is my strengthening. Uh, Asides of that, footwear can make a difference. So common logic is that if you're wearing a high drop footwear, a footwear where there's a say 10 millimeter drop, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, gastrosoleus is not optimally stretched. So again, going to a low drop footwear or a barefoot footwear would actually solve your problem. So muscle strengthening, muscle stretches, and reviewing the uh, quality of foot or the type of footwear you're use, using is what comes to my mind for you. Great. Uh, doctor, there's a question from Mr. Jayesh Panchal. He wants to know that there are many runners who started running only recently from the past one year, but they're running full or even half, uh, half or even full marathons currently. Is it okay from a physical point yeah, of view? Again, the short answer is if they're managing it, it's okay because all of us have different physical abilities. But right. I think the things that you got to cursorily look at is how much fatigue do you get after your run? So if I do a long run on a Sunday, let's say I've done a 15K on a Sunday and the next three days I'm like plastered. I'm mm. obviously, my body is not fit to be doing that 15K and I should be talking of consolidating 5K runs and then going there. The other is heart rate. Like, uh, you know, the you know the math that 220 minus age is your maximum permissible heart rate. For example, if you're 50, my mm. maximum per permissible heart rate is 170. That's, That's right. actually not the maximum permissible. Yeah. percent of that is the maximum permissible. So at 50, if I'm hitting the 150 mark, I'm actually pushing my heart to the limit. So again, I would do, this is again a th rule of thumb. It's not detail, mm -hmm. detailing it yet. So if yeah. on both these parameters, they are fine. I I'm going to say that it takes six months to start training from zero for a full half marathon and a year for a full marathon. So again, the short answer to the, uh, to Mr. Jayesh Panchal's question is it's okay. Yeah. Right. 
so doctor we've already passed six o'clock i uh, don't want to take up too much of your time however there are some questions would you like to filter and answer the knee uh, the back questions from me uh, it's up to you i'm i'm at your disposal time wise i'm okay but i don't know how the webinar is shaped and uh, no if you have some time then we'll, we'll just run quick quick answers to the questions uh, that have been asked and uh, Mr. Pritham Singh is asking about heart zones while running. I think you just mentioned about uh, the age minus, I mean, the 220 minus age. No, that's the heart rate. But zones, right. it's a very specific question, unfortunately. I think maybe we should skip it because okay. uh, I know your question is very, very specific. But zones are person specific and sport specific, which means a person, Dr. Abhay Nene, will have different right. zones for cycling, different zones for running. And okay. these zones uh, are... Uh, from zone 1 to zone 5, zone 1 being the easiest, zone 5 being the hardest, they mm -hmm. are categorized based on how your VO2 max, which means your uh, how much you're, you're exhausting yourself doing a certain activity. So the, the answer is slightly longer and a little more intense. So maybe I would not like to cover more than this in this discussion. But um, uh, again, if I had to put you across to someone, then Ashish Contractor, who's a cardiac rehab guy at HN Reliance, is right. the right and or uh, maybe you know the cycling coach Nigel at Sports Med in Parel. These are mm -hmm. great resources who can help you find your zone for that sport. Very well said, Doctor. Thank you so much. Swapnil is here. Swapnil, would you like to unmute and uh, ask your question? He says he's to run previously 10 to 15k, but went through L4, L5 distectomy seven months ago, and the big toe was not moving up. Now with physio, he can manage to run, but feel the leg is not that strong, and he's 50 years old. Yeah, he's so the toe, if he had developed a toe drop, softly, that means it was a significant nerve injury. You've had the surgery, so you're out of it. Uh, you have to now think back and say, why did you need the operation? Because there was a, a highly degenerated disc that eventually slipped and caused a nerve injury. The surgery has got you back to that degenerated disc, not solved your degenerated disc. So the short answer is, Optimize your body weight and double or triple your trunk strengthening exercises. Make your muscles, your ab muscles, your obliques, your sides, your back muscles three times as strong as they were before and go and safely run. Your leg will not feel heavy. So it's all about rehab, reconditioning. Again, we have, we are fine, has physios in our team who can help you through this. But if you do this, there's absolutely no problem. I told you my discectomy patients are doing uh, uh, ultra marathons. Yes. It's no problem. Thanks. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Swapnil. So there's another question, doctor. I'm beginner in running since Feb 23. I'm running, I'm 51. Now my left leg ankle was twisted in one marathon, but after rest in medicine, it's recovered. Since two marathons, I use surgeon socks, giving big relax. Okay, thank you for that. I want to get an answer on how we can keep keep fit while running on Worley Bandra ceiling as it is titled and tilted. It's it's tilted. Style, probably. Yeah. And I observe the flat portion gives more relax, but on the tiled, it gives pain and pressure on the other leg. I'm also diabetic and having uric acid towards six. So what I'm drawing out of this question is yeah. that hill running is causing the problem. And it's yeah. known to cause a problem because when you're running uphill, your body weight can up to double. And when you're running downhill, it can actually up to triple. So the yeah. simple tips for hill running is that, of course, strength building in the leg, which we keep talking about. You can do yes. cycling as a alternate sport, you're going to do leg building exercises. But a simple, uh, use, useful trip is, a trick is that when you're running uphill, of course, the tilt on the ceiling is very, very gradual. So it should not bother you. It's more mental. Don't look, don't look for it. Just look, you know, look at your feet and run. But um, take shorter steps. So if you're, sh if you're taking shorter steps, your cadence, which means your steps per minute remain the same and you're able to uh, uh, fatigue yourself less. So basically take shorter steps and slow down your pace when you're running uphill and before that just strengthen all your muscles that's the only only right answer and as far as the uric acid i think we've got, uh, covered that but i'm very happy that you've started running and i hope to see you at the start line this year yeah she says she's running the full marathon she or he is running the full marathon this year there's another question is uh, the person has had a surgery for meniscus tear and wants to restart running and how to go about it so again it's the same rule that if the meniscus tear has been dealt with so you've had a surgery and fixed it or the doctor who was treating you has given a green flag saying that this does not need any arthroscopy or any fix or repair. Then you're good to restart running. Again, ask yourself why you got that meniscus tear. If it was a one-time injury, it's a different thing. But if it's a chronic tear, which means that without really getting a major injury tore, it's a degenerative tear. And you got to think about why you got it 
and why will you not get it again if you do the same thing so the thing that you can do differently is once again strengthening the muscles around your knee making sure that your running form doesn't overload the knee i'm going to say this again when you run your knee should be on the top of your ankle not way forward and not way back and your you know footwear should be good but i i'm still going to say that if you've already injured your meniscus and you're not a pro runner you have to look at swimming cycling as your alternatives and save your knee for those precious runs that give you that great high understood next question is can high grade medical collateral ligament injury near the femoral area taking rest and recovery by physio can run fast i think we took this question we took this question about medial collateral ligament yes 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 if it's a tear or a strain we about this precautions at 60 shoes yeah. to be worn so 60 basically all of us who are push, pushing age should make your make sure that your cardiac status is fine personally with no symptoms i've had a cardiac ct angio done just to rule out because i do high altitude mountaineering and um, or i get my cardiologist i check my cholesterol regularly make sure your heart is okay i mean that's the only thing and uh, again cursorily look at your knee capacity like if you can go up and down two floors of uh, you know in your building without hurting your knee maybe you're good to run remember that after 35 you start losing 3% of your muscle mass without doing anything that's called sarcopenia and you got to work harder muscles have the capacity to regenerate at any age so work harder on your muscle you got to run harder to stay in the same place so work harder on your muscle fitness make sure that your heart is in a good shape and run shoes there are no precautions i mean whatever suits you is fine personally i like lighter shoes shoes that are more you know flatter and more flexible rather than the big big ones with big soles that cage my foot and dictate how i run i like to run more free right 74 from mysore run regularly 365 days that's awesome but first kilometers of warm up it's okay that's fine i think the i'm great that you, i'm 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 excited that you at 74 you're running every day <laughs> and um, you do warm up for the first 1k so i think the the, the take away from your question is that warm up is necessary because the engine in your body starts revving if you suddenly start running hard and you're not a pro runner you're more prone to injury or you know some setbacks so warm up is a great idea stretching and warm up is a great idea stretching should be ideally post run not cold stretching because cold stretching can cause more injury right next, next is running on road is on concrete is it good or bad it's absolutely okay you're seeing a guy who's been running on hard tar in south bombay for 30 years by now i should have really cracked something i've not so it's absolutely okay there are some even doctors who say it's not okay but there's no proof of that so if you're comfortable just go ahead and run there's no problem which supplement should i take for running also how much mileage per week is safe uh, supplements personally i being a vegetarian only take proteins but there's no specific supplement that is known to be good for running just make sure that all of us who are while we are training are taking minimum 1 gram per kilogram body weight of protein in veg, in the veg diet it's impossible so i take sattu or i take sometimes whey proteins but find find your way and um, the uh, how much mileage per week is again again it's your own own yes. thing anywhere from 20 25 uh, kilometers a week you know going up to 50 kilometers a week is also okay but don't suddenly up your mileage up your mileage at 10 the rule of 10% every fortnight is okay right and then someone says after 15 or 16 k we start getting pain at the sole below the toe and toe nail and also solution for skin rashes kirti the question is very good because if you're getting toe toe nail pain you're wearing a loose shoe because when you run if your foot is moving within your shoe it's hitting the front of the shoe it should be a snug fitting uh, foot uh, footwear so if your footwear is loose you'll start hitting your toenail i'm assuming that you par it means cut your toenail adequately also try not to cramp your toes it's one of the mistakes we make when we run we clench our this thing and we cramp our toes keep your toes relaxed make sure your uh, footwear is appropriately sized and has a good wide toe box and uh, the skin uh, skin rashes is normally reactionary so if it's if it's blisters it's different but again if it's a foot blister it is bad footwear you're wearing a foot that's a shoe that's too loose for you right so nidhi has another question saying that after delivery she got a pain in the left knee and she did uric acid test arthritis and everything everything is fine whole year her left knee uh, pain and in winter it gets worse and she's doing exercises started walk run for half an hour would it be feasible for her to start her marathon is what she so i'm assuming nidhi is younger because she's had a pregnancy i'm assuming right. recently so a younger person is less at a risk of osteoarthritis but the common cause of pain in a younger lady is the patellofemoral syndrome what i described where the patella doesn't glide correctly 
and VMO strengthening exercises, vastus medialis oblicus strengthening exercises. Look it up on YouTube. Will solve your problem. Make sure that you're taking adequate vitamin D and you're stretching your hamstrings enough. So hamstring stretch, VMO strengthening and vitamin D intake. And of course, optimizing your to your pre-pregnancy body weight. Then right. you're good to go and run. Right. So then there's another person saying that thank you for this wonderful session. And he has a question that did their ECG and found the heart rate is 46. Further did the 2D echo, which is normal. And what's your expert opinion? Just one year old runner. And yeah, he's a he's a big he's cyclist. cyclist. He's a 100, 200 kilometer cyclist, he or she. And yes. it's very common for, you know, these guys to have a low heart rate. My The guy who I run with has a standard resting heart rate of 42. So it's no problem. Oh. Um, again, just as a as a tip, you know, if you're looking at 20, 30 years of good output, after 40, 45, it's, it's a good idea to do a stress test or ideally a cardiac CT angio and get it off your head. It takes away all the problems. A high okay. heart rate is a problem. A low heart rate and an endurance athlete is okay. No problem. Right. Question from Arun says... Sorry, that... sorry. I, I just want to uh, just say yeah. one more thing there. What is currently being uh, looked at as the marker of cardiac fitness is the difference between your resting heart rate and your maximum heart rate. So if okay. you're getting up with 46 heart rate, but when you're running, your heart rate is 150, there's a problem. But from yeah. 46, it goes to 120. Like mine from 70 goes to 140. No problem. Okay. I hope I hope I've got that out. Yes, yes. That's Thank you for that. Uh, Arun is saying that he has a pain uh, in the back of his heel and after a few kilometers of run, it doesn't pain much. What is the exercise you should do? So tendo actually is strengthening, uh, stretching exercises. So you stretch your stretch your ankle that lengthens the ankle. Uh, you do uh, toe ups, which means uh, single leg toe ups, like heel raises to strengthen the uh, ca the calf muscle and the tendo actualis. And you make sure that your footwear is optimized. Again, the same thing. That people who get a pain on the back of the heel should either wear a slightly more drop or a less drop, whatever suits them. My personal uh, preference is towards a lesser drop, which means you try running barefoot and the pain okay. may go away. And vitamin D deficiency, most of us have because yeah. there's no adequate sunlight. We all take 60,000 units of vitamin D every month and check right. our vitamin Ds once a year. So I think that's a that's an easy way to remember. Okay, thank you for that. And Ramesh Singh is saying that when he does uh, hill sprints, a month back suddenly felt that there's some stone or bullet which hit him on the left leg calf. He's totally immobilized and when shown to the physio, he was told that it is a muscle pull in the calf. Some tendon. It's not a pull, it's a tear. What yeah. he's describing because he was sprinting. Sprinting yeah. is a very intense activity and uphill. When you're running uphill, you can imagine your, your yes. ankle is at a position of disadvantage. It's taking the double weight on a position of disadvantage. Like normally yeah. your ankle is at 90 and you're running uphill. It's like an acute angle and it's propelling you forward. And it's a very calf unfriendly activity running uphill. And you've got to be fit to do that. The bullet that you mentioned is a tear or a snap in some of the muscle fibers. Right. So again, ideally, if you're a, Ramesh, if you're a good long distance, long time runner, uh, uh, ultrasound is a very poor interpretation. An MRI at a good center, like good centers for musculoskeletal imaging, you should do that to find out how much you've damaged it rather than just listening to your physio and taking ultrasonics because that is just TLC, tender loving care. It's not really fixing the problem. Right. Find out the, the, the in, uh, amount of injury. Hopefully it's not in the tendon, but it's in the muscle and that will get quickly covered up and they will advise you on how soon you can get back to running. So I would be worried for this, uh, for Ramesh, for your injury. Right. Next is uh, again the uh, the Hill. portion not hills means tilting one side pressure on one leg other leg is on little high and one leg is on tilted low is that is what the person is saying to the previous question of uh, running on the tilts. My question is tilted portion not hills which means tilting one So I'm not actually able to, uh, if he can unmute and ask that question. Yeah, actually, we don't know who this is because the name is showing Renuka Pinto. So, so no, but he hears us. So if he can come on and unmute himself yeah, I mean, or put your name down. So I'm sorry, I'm not able to fully understand this. Yeah, if you can just, but, you know, honestly, I'm happy to share my email address to everyone. And you're getting, yes, I think that'll be brilliant. I can answer only that many. So don't, don't be a pressure of time, but I will hope to answer because I'm enjoying this myself. Yes. I'm training for a full marathon, but pain on the lateral side of the knee. The MRI showed grade 2 sprain edema. 
to brace physio. Of course, you can after rest. So three weeks is the time that a sprain takes to heal. After that, you strengthen your medial muscle and go back to running. Again, analyze why it caused you, why, why this injury happened. If you've done nothing wrong and it injured, means there's some problem in your form, your footwear, etc. Form, fatigue and um, uh, fitness. Work on that and get back so you don't re-injure yourself. But you can get back 100%. Uh, can we use knee compression stocks? You mentioned kneecap is not necessary. So compression socks only for the knee joint are the same as a kneecap. But what, um, uh, for example, what compression stocking Sorgan uh, is talking yeah. about compresses the calf muscle, which is your peripheral heart, and it aids the recirculation. So that's a different thing from a compression of the knee itself. So compression of the knee, not needed. Yeah, so the question is, what about the compression socks? So should we use them? Can we use them? Yes, we, okay. we discussed that again, that compression stockings aid uh, pooled blood in the periphery to go back up to the heart for recircul and recleaning and improves the oxygenation of your muscles. But remember that you uh, it's a good thing to do, but you got to ease into it and your sizing is very, very critical. So yes. get from the yes. right people who can size it correctly for you, otherwise you're in trouble. And once yes. again, that's where our sponsors for today's show come in, that they, they are the right people, just source it from the right place. Thank you, doctor. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Sagar who says that he's a physio from Amravati and he's happy to be in the session. Thank you, Sagar. I hope you can help all the other people on the on this uh, seminar. <laughs> yes. And Kirti Kabras is very grateful because she's, uh, she's saying thank you for satisfying a uh, solution for both her problems. And we don't know anyone else who's saying someone is thanking again you doctors, but we don't know who. And there's Ramesh Singh who's asking what causes loss of padding on both of the feet, entire bottom part of the sole. So I'm assuming that he means loss of padding means it's looking thinned out. And that's again a poor sign. Loss of padding means when you feel the sole, the muscles are looking less padded. That's a bad sign because that's again a sign of sarcopenia. And you got to do more and more of intrinsic foot muscle exercises. Again, it's out there on YouTube. It's about... Yes creating a better, stronger arch. Otherwise, it can lead to foot injury. So, yeah, think, uh, worry uh, about it and worry about protein intake also, Ramesh ji. Correct. And there's somebody saying who's 46 years old male. Did, yesterday, he did a 10K and his average heart rate was 168 and highest heart rate was 186. I'd worry. I'd worry for a 186. And I'm going to say that your uh, engine is not good enough for the speed that you're running. So, you want to pull your speed back and, you know, even 160 is okay. But uh, 180 is not okay. I would say that. So I would say that you've got to cut down on your speed, not necessarily the distance, and uh, have a heart rate monitor, your Garmin, while you're running. And run initially uh, with a target to maintain your heart rate down rather than to achieve a certain speed. And then gradually, as your, as your machinery gets better, you'll be able to run the same speed at a lower heart rate. All right. I think we discussed about the knee pain. Now, somebody says there is pain on the side of the knees, so... I think you already mentioned about strengthening the, the muscles around. And uh, Ms. Urmila asks how to avoid cramps while coming down from the pedal road after 34 kilometers. So that's the thing. At 34, your muscles have really shot out. They're totally fatigued. When you're running downhill, the load is triple. So you got to run. The two things I can say is run slowly downhill. Don't attack the downhill. And heel toe running, which is actually not, not the given. Rather than forefoot running, hind foot running. So softly running into the downhills will actually help you. Right. So I think we have the last uh, question from Madhav uh, Joshi. So Madhav, I have unmuted you. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Wants to know about glutes. Madhav, Madhav what's the specific question? Uh, Madhav, are you in the room? Well, I don't think he's there. It's just the question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Madhu. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, thank you, doctor, for this session. I just wanted to ask that uh, when I run, uh, sometimes my uh, upper glutes, I get some pain. It recedes, actually. I do some foam rolling also. But then I am a regular runner. I have been running for 11, 12 years. But still, sometimes it comes up. So, what should be the reason? So, sometimes it's the form. So, glute pain is normally linked to the back strength. So, uh, okay. if your back muscles are weak, your form of your pelvis is poor. So, the, if uh, glutes actually control how your pelvis tilts when you run. So, again, the short answer is work on back strengthening exercises, back extensors, supermans, work on better abs 
and do the glute stretches rather than foam roll. I know a lot of people are sold out to foam rolling, but it is not a substitute for actual stretching, you know, knee to chest stretching and the strengthening of the glutes. So that should take care. I just worry that if okay. you say upper glutes, it should not mean low back. But anyway, it will get covered if you do good back extension exercises, good oblique muscle strengthening exercises, side planks, side okay. sit-ups. That will cover it. But don't worry. I think you will be good. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. So, oh, we had more questions while I said that was the last question. Well, we have uh, Mr. Anil who says, thank you for the session. And uh, yes, I think it's all about saying thank you and people asking about a recording. Yes. A recording will be provided shortly, definitely. Uh, the again, Mr. Ramesh is last asked, lastly asking when I run, I have seen that I'm doing heel strike instead of front foot strike. Do what you like, no problem. The, the, this there was a lot of bad press about heel strike, but it's now been shown that it's whatever you like is okay, whatever is comfortable for you is okay. The most optimum, which means that you can optimize your um, performance by doing a mid foot strike. So initially, it went from hind foot to fore foot. But now a midfoot strike is what you know is better. Uh, normally, by running a hind foot, you're um, you're slowing down your pace a bit, and your muscles are working slightly more for the same effort. So, if you wish, you can like I've calculatedly moved. I used to be a hind foot runner. I've become a midfoot runner, and what has helped me is wearing zero sole shoes. But all this happens in the in between time, not in the performance zone, but in the training zone. So right. through here, you work on this, and then you can execute it for your one or two marathons that you do. I hope I've answered your question. Yes. Thank you so much, doctor. This is very, very insightful. So basically, I think to sum it up, it, all conditions with everything, you can definitely, you know, pursue your goals of running the marathon, but with guided, you know, attention from experts, uh, with doctors like you and your team. Fitness, and fatigue, remember. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, doctor, for such a wonderful uh, session. And uh, really, really grateful for your time. Thank you so Join much. Myself, thank you. Let's have some a few more in the near future. Yes. And Bye. see you all at TMM. We are at stall number 56 at the Expo. Thank you. Bye-bye.